So when we were living in, uh, in Missouri, I uh, had a friend started coming to our church, and uh, his name was Corey, and early in our uh, in relationship with Corey, getting to know him, he, uh, he just kind of leveled with me in his living room one day, and he said, you got to know, you need to know something about me. I struggle with addiction, and it's been a long time struggle with me, and sometimes I do well, and sometimes I'm not doing well. I said, well, how, how are you right now? Where, where are you at right now? And he said, well, right now, we're not doing too well. And he said, well, I, you know, I, um, I, I believe God can help. I believe in the power of recovery. I believe in the power of accountability. I believe in the 12-step program where, where Jesus is at the center of it, and we'll walk with you. And we walked with Corey. Corey had his ups. Corey had his downs. Sometimes Corey would, uh, Corey would just not, uh, would, would not call and not be in contact, and those of us who walked with him knew what that meant. I, uh, I can be... I can be pretty black and white sometimes. And I believe in justice. And I just remember thinking that, you know, when it comes to things like driving under the influence, if you injure somebody, like we have enough knowledge in society these days that you know what's going to happen and that if you get in an accident driving under the influence and injure somebody or even worse, how can that not be considered premeditated, intentional, making a choice when we all know that is the consequences? And so in my mind, thinking in terms of justice, I've had very clear opinions and very strong opinions that someone who injures somebody else driving under the influence should receive the strictest penalty possible. And then one day I get the call from Corey. He said, man, I'm, I cannot believe what I did. I swore it would never happen, but it happened. I was driving under the influence. I got in an accident, and I hurt somebody. And all of a sudden, my strict, clear, black and white view of justice was challenged because my friend, who had a wife and kids at home, and a mortgage to pay, and they were depending on him and his job to provide. And if he's going to be in jail, locked up, loss of income, and there's lots of consequences, and their family's already paying a high price, but there was going to be even more. And all of a sudden, when it got personal with a name and he was my friend, my idea of absolute black and white justice was challenged. See, maybe, I mean, well, that is why we talk about justice being blind, because... When we personalize it, it just messes with our heads too much, right? And all of a sudden, when it was my friend, I was ready to advocate for mercy and grace. So as we're thinking about grace, grace is a lot like a rubber band. It only works when there's tension. Too much tension, and everybody gets stressed out and anxious, wondering who's going to get whacked in the eye when the thing breaks. No tension, no value. Grace only works like a rubber band with tension. That's why we're taking several weeks to talk through it. Today what we're going to talk about is that it's worth the struggle to engage the tension. You and I are probably never going to fully satisfy, fully wrap our heads around it and get to a place where with grace there's no tension at all. It just comes along with it. But here's what I want to encourage you to do today is to push through and struggle through the tension that comes along with believing and buying into grace and to just accept the struggle because it's worth the struggle. Another story I want to share with you. This one has a good ending. A guy by the name of Paul, um, he was following Jesus, and um, Jesus was working in his life, and he was feeling convicted about his language, that his language and the words that were coming out of his mouth were not honoring to God. He was really struggling with cussing, and so uh, he got together with a friend at church one day, and he shared with his friend, I'm really feeling convicted about this. I need some work on this. I need some accountability, and so I need you to hold me accountable. And so they came up with a plan in which Paul would meet his friend before church when, whenever he got to church on Sunday, and he would report in, and he would have a 
a time of accountability and share with him how many times he had cussed throughout the week. And they set up a deal where then he would, um, he would, he would give an offering to the church in, of $5 for every cuss word he had said during the week. Okay? And so the next week they got to church and he's like, oh, not too great of a week. I got to give $100 today. Now, just go with it, okay? Some of you are like, not bad. $100 a day, you know, at some points in my life. Um, and so we put the $100 in. Next week, he came back and did a little bit better, and so the amount was a little bit less. And the third week, he comes to church, and he was a little bit discouraged because he was still struggling. And now we're three weeks in, and he's like putting a lot of extra money in the church offering plate, right? The next week, you get to church, and he's down. He's like, this just, ah, something's not working. We've got accountability. There's like a price. We're just like, it's just not working. What do I do, I do about this? And Well, his friend said, Paul, I'm going to change the terms of the deal. I'm going to change it up. I'm just going to make a decision. It's going to cost you more and less. It's called grace. Come back next week. Tell me how you did. So he goes throughout the week has another rough week, doesn't understand what his friend's going to do, and he comes back to church, and he says, okay, time for accountability. He's like, yeah, I didn't do too well. And his friend said, okay, here you go. His friend pulled out a check. Um, this is like money, if you're not familiar with these, okay? Uh, I couldn't figure out a better way to tell this in a, in a more modern day time, so just, if you're still confused afterwards, come find me, I'll, 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 I'll we'll have a little lesson in how this all works, but it's like money. Um, His friend pulled out a check, and it was written out to the church. It was dated for that morning, and it was signed by his friend. But the amount was left blank. And he said, your, st your sin still costs, but for you, it's free. Just fill in the amount. Drop it in the offering plate. And next week, there will be more. And Paul took the check. He wrote it out for $55. Put it on the offering plate. Came back the next week, another blank check written on his friend's bank account. He wrote in $20, put it in the offering plate. Third week, he came back, another blank check. He said, Guess what? I don't need it this week. It cost him too much to fill in those checks. And he experienced grace and walked into obedience and growth like he'd never seen before. Today we're going to talk again about grace. We're talking about how grace is amazing. And my goal for you, my prayer for you in these weeks is that you would be amazed by grace again or maybe for the first time ever. Our simple definition that we're giving to grace is grace is getting what you don't deserve. We started off with a simple survey a few weeks ago, four, three weeks, four weeks ago, whatever we started this, and um, several of you participated in the survey, and it's been really, really helpful. And today we're going to uh, today we're going to look through the survey. The survey was really it was, it was simple. It was only one question: How do you struggle with grace? Because the reality is we all struggle with grace in some way, and a whole bunch of people responded, and the data was really helpful to see how we struggle. Today we're going to look at each one of these, and my goal and my attempt today is to help you with whichever one you chose as your primary struggle with grace is to help you struggle through it and push through your struggle and to experience that grace really is amazing again. I believe that it is worth the struggle and God's going to help you with the struggle. To do that, we're going to talk about a few stories. Here is story number one. When I saw this story, I was like, oh yeah, that story grips me. The other story we're going to talk through is a story that if you've been walking with us for a couple of weeks, you've heard it for a couple of weeks. It's so powerful, there's way more than we could unpack in just one week. That's why we're going back to it every week. It's a story of when Jesus, the new 
interesting rabbi, Jewish religious teacher comes into town and a guy by the name of Simon, who was probably one of the wealthier members in town because he has a, a large enough home to have a courtyard area and has enough disposable income to throw a feast. He throws a feast and he invites Jesus over for a large dinner and invites everybody who's anybody in the town to join them. They're gathered in the courtyard of Simon's home and uh, they are having their dinner and a woman who everybody knows in the town, but they don't really know her. They just know about her and her reputation for being sinful and you can fill in the blanks to whatever that meant right she had the reputation of being a sinful person she comes in interrupts the dinner and as Jesus and everybody else is reclining at the table with their their hands and their mouths near the table and their feet kicked out to the to the outside she comes and she falls at Jesus's feet weeping wipes his feet with her hair takes a little vial of, of, of a costly perfume, probably her most treasured, most expensive possession, and breaks it open, pours it on Jesus' feet. And the host, Simon, who we discover is a Pharisee, a, a, a follower of God who joined a group of people who were devoted to God and devoted to meticulously obeying all of the rules that God had given, all the laws that God had given, and that was their devotion to God. They were Jews, they were Pharisees, they called themselves, and he thinks to himself, if this man Jesus really were a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman is touching him. He would know that she's a sinner and he would run from her. And Jesus replies to him, Simon, let me tell you a story. There were two people. They both were in debt. One owed the bank $60,000, the other owed the bank $6,000. Unfortunately, neither one of them could pay the debt. They were in trouble of foreclosure, but the banker forgave both of their debts. Now, Simon, tell me, who will love the banker more? And Simon the Pharisee says, well, duh. The guy who owes $60,000 will love the banker more than the person who only owed $6,000. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. And he says, this woman, I came into your house. You didn't offer me anything to wash my feet, but she has washed them with her tears, dried them with her hair. You did not offer me oil, perfume to wash my face, freshen up. She has put perfume on my feet. You didn't offer me the customary welcome kiss on the cheek. She has not stopped kissing my feet from the moment she came in. I tell you that her sins, though they are many, have been forgiven. And she loves a lot because she has had a lot of sins forgiven. But he who loves little, Simon, he who thinks he only has a few sins forgiven, Simon, loves little. Love the story. There's so much there about grace. There's some tension there, right? Unfortunately, we don't know how the story ends up. So we just kind of have to imagine, and we hope, and we guess, and we try to imagine the best ending possible, right? Like, we really hope that, that, that the woman, the unnamed woman in the story, I wish we knew what her name was so we could call her by her name, but, but we really hope that she is so moved and that for the rest of her life she stays faithful to Jesus, she loves Jesus, she serves Jesus, and she continues to stay amazed by grace through the rest of her life and to grow into God's best for her. We hope. We don't, we don't know, though. And we hope that Simon the Pharisee burns in hell. That would make Jesus very happy. No. No. We hope that Simon the Pharisee had a moment where he knew he was the ungrateful $6,000 debtor who still was broke and unable to pay. We hope that soon after Jesus left, Simon found a place of repentance and prayer and realized just how much he was a sinner desperately in need of God's grace. Because yes, even the Pharisees, some of them found Jesus. 
You see, we know of one guy in the Bible. He's really, really famous because he ended up preaching to more people than Jesus did and writing most of our New Testament. He was a Pharisee. Guy by the name of Saul. In fact, he was the son of a Pharisee. He was in deep. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and his personality just drove him to like obey the law perfectly. He said he did it well, and he just devoted himself to obeying God perfectly. He studied the Bible, memorized the Bible, and lived it. And he was focused on it. And 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 he was well. He just kind of had understood his mission in life was to take care of all of these liars, right? Because he'd heard about this guy named Jesus, this guy who went around healing people, forgiving people of their sins, which only God could do, claiming to be the Son of God, which is blasphemy, deserving of death according to what God had said. And this Jesus guy, Paul believed, he just got what he had coming to him in which God sent his wrath and through the Romans crucified him and took him out for his blasphemy, claiming to be the Son of God. But then some of this guy's followers made up this story that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and they're going around telling people about how Jesus is the Son of God, resurrected from the dead, and that he died on the cross to forgive their sins, and that is just blasphemy, see, blasphemy, heresy. They're spreading lies, and so his mission is to stamp out the liars. Until one day he's going into town ready to arrest some liars, and Jesus Christ himself shows up, not just in some, like, vision not just some weird hallucination, no, like in person. Paul says that it was later, so his name is Saul. When he goes and eventually he goes and he, 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 he preaches and teaches to non-Jewish people. They call him Paul, just the way the kind of languages work, right? So you can call him Saul or Paul, either one. Later on, he's going to say that when he saw Jesus, that it was the same kind of a post-resurrection appearance as when Jesus showed himself to the other disciples and let him put their hands into his wounds, saw it, feel it, touched it. It was that real. It was that person, personal. It was in person. Because that's what Paul needed, and he just has this moment of insight, and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Paul saw has to reconcile what he believes with what he's experienced, and he cannot doubt that Jesus Christ is alive and well. And I just believe, like, with reason and logic, looking back at the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit bringing truth to his mind, helping him think through it clearly and in truth, Paul realizes, wait a second, If I saw him, that means he's alive. The only way he's alive is if God would have resurrected him. God wouldn't have resurrected him unless he really was speaking the truth. God wouldn't resurrect a blasphemer. And if he's speaking the truth, then he really is the son of God. And if he really is the son of God, then his death wasn't just a political death. If his death on the cross really could have been a sacrifice for sins. And Paul, I mean, mean, the story tells us, like, He's just so like confused by all of this. He goes off into the desert and spends a lot of time with God, with his Bible, studying, and the Holy Spirit is revealing truth to him. And he becomes absolutely 100% convinced that Jesus is real, that he really is the Son of God. And Paul goes from this, this uh, zealot who is stamping out the liars to being a chief leader among the followers of Jesus. And he goes and he preaches to more people than Jesus even preached to and brings a whole bunch more people to Jesus with the good news that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died to forgive us of our sins and was raised from the dead again. He goes and he starts a whole bunch of people come to Jesus. He gathers them together. He's like, okay, you guys are a church now and you got to encourage each other. You got to learn more and help each other to be obedient and then tell even more people about Jesus. And he just goes from village to village and town to town all over the, the, the ancient Roman world and colony to colony raising up churches and Jesus followers. It's awesome. And then he writes back to them. And a lot of our New Testament, from the book of Romans onward, most of it are, are Paul's letters that he writes to these followers of Jesus. And he helps correct some of their misunderstandings, and he helps encourage them forward. The book of Ephesians is one of those books where he writes a word of encouragement to help them go deeper in their faith, to understand it better, to love Jesus more, to obey God better. And that's where we're going to kind of pick it up today because he's going to talk about grace. He's going to give us, give us some very clear teaching and instruction and a visual, okay? Here's what he says. We know that it's all about Jesus. The good news of God is all about Jesus, the Son of God who came from heaven to earth, and he was the Son of God, died, and really truly was resurrected in body. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling over the whole earth. That's the story. Now, what does that have to do with you and me? 
we also have a similar Jesus story of death, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of God. He Listen to how he talks about it. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's just read a few verses here, starting at verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's not working, those who are disobedient. And not just you, verse 3, all of us also. And that includes me, he says. And that includes you. And that includes me. Every one of us in the room. Every one of us watching online. All of us. We also lived among them at one time. And what did we do? We, 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 we were gratifying the cravings of our flesh, of our human nature. We just did what we wanted to do, and that was the good life. Following after its desires and thoughts. Like everybody else, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. We didn't deserve God's love. We didn't deserve to be close to God because we were running away from him. And God being a God of justice and God, a God, of, God being a God of holiness, he should have pushed us even farther away and helped us run faster away from him. But, but, verse 4, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. In other words, we were dead in our sins, in the grave in our sins, separated from God, the author of life. And God, the author of life, raised Jesus from the dead and he resurrected us from the dead, from the dead, being dead in our sins, new life, new birth, we call it, being born again. We have our own resurrection and it is all by God's grace. And God raised us up with Christ and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, in the future, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. He's like, you and I, we've got a seat next to Jesus. And in a way, we've been resurrected and we're sitting there even now by faith. We imagine it, but in the future, it's going to be for real and it's going to be in person and it's going to be awesome. We just have to wait a little bit. Why? It's all, all, all because of God's grace. We don't deserve any of it. What we deserve is to be dead in our sins, which is where we were to stay there. That's what we deserve. That's the choices we made. But no, God wouldn't have that by his grace. He forgave us. Raised us up, new birth, new life, second chance, 20th chance, 1,000th chance. And he's got a whole eternity ready for us. How does that happen? Verse 8. Why don't you read verse 8 with me? Come on, read it out loud like we all believe it. Come on, here we go. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Tracy, go back three slides. We're going to read it again. This time, I want you to personalize it and not just say, for it is by grace you have been saved. Let's personalize it and say, for it is by grace we have been saved. Got it? Here we go. Come on, read it again. For it is by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God. Listen to what he says here, okay? We are made, we're saved, which means we're made right with God. Our sins are forgiven. Every good thing that we have in relationship with God, all of that happens only by God's grace that comes down from God to us. It is by grace we are saved. It is by grace we are forgiven. It is by grace we are raised up to new life again. It is by grace we get a second chance, third chance, one thousandth chance. It is all by his grace. How do we receive it for ourselves? How do we like get his grace? Because there's some folks who haven't experienced his grace. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. In other words, in other words, in other words God's grace is available. But we don't experience it and experience the power of it and the benefits of it except by faith to accept his grace. And faith is not just believing in our heads, but it's like trusting 
in his grace, accepting it. And look what he says here. It's the gift of God. What is he talking about is the gift of God? Our faith that says yes to Jesus, we don't drum that up ourselves. You didn't have faith because you're just such a faith-filled person. The only way you and I even have the ability to say yes to Jesus and grab onto his grace is because even our faith is a gift from God. God in his grace gives us grace even before we say yes to him in giving us the ability to accept him. And so we can't take credit for anything. It's the gift of God. And then look at verse 9. He says, let's go back to this grace part. It is by grace you have been saved. And you can't take credit for the faith, but you can't even take credit for the grace because it is by grace you have been saved, not by works. So contrary to every Pharisee, whether Jewish Pharisee or a Christ-claiming Pharisee who tries to prove our worth to God, earn our way back into good graces with God. Contrary to the long list of reasons that you list to justify and verify being a good person, we are saved and made right with God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are made right with God through his grace, received by faith. And even that is a gift. No boasting. No credit. No reason to think that you're somebody because of how good of a person you are or because you have faith in Jesus. You were dead, lost, deserving of wrath, I was dead, lost, deserving of wrath. But God in his great love for all of us gives all of us the ability and the option and the choice to receive his grace. So God gives grace. I receive it by faith. The sins are forgiven. We're made right with God, reconciled with God, at peace with God. I get peace of mind, peace of heart. It's grace. It's amazing. It's a blank check. Drawn on the bank of the power and the mercy and the goodness of God. Signed by Jesus. Fill in the blank. I don't know if there's enough space there for all the zeros, though. Okay, so grace, right? We struggle with God's grace. We've heard some stories. We looked at some scripture, heard some teaching. So now let's, let's talk about what it means how we personally struggle through the struggle with grace. So here's the, the results of our survey that we took. And many of you, we had like 170 or so people text in and respond um, of Your greatest struggle with grace is to believe it, feel it, appreciate it, show it, need it. Here are the results here. And so let's just kind of talk through each of these. And here's what I'm going to do with each of these. Really what I want to do is just maybe share some of my own experiences, my own stories, or my own ways of struggling through some of these. Maybe it's helpful for you. There's a couple Bible verses that have really been helpful for me. If you know of Bible verses that have helped you or stories that have helped you, maybe you just you know share those with me later or share them with your small group. Um, this is a lot of our conversation in our small group this week is to help each other um, struggle through accepting grace. <coughs> so let's... Let's, uh, let's talk through these. So the, the first group, the first answer, are the 26 people who said, my greatest struggle with grace is to believe it. In other words, kind of in my head, to believe and wrap my head around the fact that Jesus died for me, that God loves me personally. It's so hard for me to even believe it, not necessarily feel it. We're going to talk about that one next, but for those of you who struggle to believe it. I believe we get at these a couple of different ways. The first way is we can reason our way into it in a way that makes sense, and when things make sense, then we can accept it. That's kind, of, that's kind of me, right? I'm kind of like the reason more than emotion. 
I've still, I can never keep that, keep it straight, whether that's right brain, left brain. I don't know, whichever side of the brain that is, I'm the side that's like reason, not too much emotion, okay? And so I remember here's how I've been able to reason through this one. If you struggle to believe that Jesus died for you and loves you personally, how do I wrap my heads around that? I can relate because I've stood and looked in the mirror too many times and wondered, how can God love me? Why would Jesus love me? And then one day, reading scripture, I get to that story where one of Jesus' followers says, Jesus, how many times do we have to forgive people who hurt us and wrong us? Like seven times? And he was intentionally like exaggerating the number because the Jewish teacher said you had to forgive someone three times. And he's like, if I double it and add one, seven, it's like the perfect number. How about seven times, Jesus? Is that, is that all I have to do? And then on the eighth time, I can write them off, push them away, condemn them, never forgive them again. And Jesus says, no, not seven times. Seven times, how about seven multiplied by 70? How about that? In other words, stop counting as many times as it takes. And I remember in that moment realizing, okay, listen, listen, what I believe about God is that God's not a liar and that God's consistent, God's faithful, which means he's, he doesn't tell us to do anything he himself doesn't do. And the light bulb came on. And I was like, if God commands me to forgive you an unlimited number of times, then surely God is ready to forgive me willingly an unlimited number of times. I believe it. I remember sitting in our living room with someone who had just given her life to Christ and Erica and I were helping her take her next steps forward in faith and she was really struggling with this piece of it as well. And in a moment, God just gave me this like great idea and, and a moment of wisdom that straight, came straight from God. And I said, hey, you know, if one of your sons, and she had two, like, awesome teenage sons, if one of your sons did something really bad and he broke the rules and he really hurt you and lost your trust, and, but then he came back to you and he said, Mom, I'm really sorry. I really messed up. And if you could read his mind and know that he was genuine and he was truly repentant and sorrowful, would you withhold forgiveness she said, no, if one of my sons came to me and said he was sorry and I knew that he would meant it, I would embrace him, hold him, and I would forgive him over and over again and tell him son, t- so many times over and over that he's forgiven so that he knows it. I said, then it only makes sense that your heavenly father who knows you, when you repent, and he knows that you mean it because he can read your mind, you say that you're sorry, and he embraces you and floods your heart with forgiveness, and he wants you to accept it. You can believe that God loves you. I, I, I believe essentially we get at these two ways, right? We can get at, we, we, can, we can struggle through them with reason. We can also, also struggle through them by way of a story. And maybe if you're not so much like reason and logic oriented, right? Brain, whichever side that is. Maybe you're a little more, need to feel it a little more emotionally oriented. One of the ways to do that is to put yourself in the story. When you put yourself as a character in the story that you're there and you can hear it and you hear Jesus say it to you and feel the embrace. Which leads us to the next one then. For the 46 people who said, I struggle, my greatest struggle with grace is to feel it and to feel God's grace. I do believe essentially this is the way you do it. You just put yourself into the story. You see yourself there. You read scripture and especially the gospels not as information to be learned so they can pass a test, but as these powerful real life stories and you put yourself there. So, 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 so the story of Jesus, Simon the Pharisee's house, the unnamed woman, right? You can put yourself around the table watching this. Or you can put yourself in the place of Simon the Pharisee watching and thinking those judgmental thoughts like unfortunately I do too often and hearing Jesus' insightful convicting words 
What do we all wish Simon the Pharisee would have done? We wish that he would have joined the woman at Jesus' feet in sorrow, repentance, and tears of repentance. And if that's you, you just put yourself in the story. Maybe you know that you are a sinner. You just put yourself in the place of the unnamed woman who's crying, weeping, tears of gratitude, joy, and forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. And she's embraced and honored by Jesus. And you just put yourself there And when you're in her place living the story, what happens is all of a sudden you can feel it. Maybe you do like I did, go online, Google blank, check, and print one off for yourself. Leave the blank, leave the amount blank. And every time you're struggling to feel it, to feel God's grace, maybe you just fill it in with whatever number seems right. You say, Jesus, you paid the debt for me. It still costs somebody, but it doesn't cost me, it costs you. Something's going to happen when you play a role in the story. How about the third one there? The 36 folks who said, my greatest struggle with grace is to appreciate it. Well, first of all, you listened to last week's message because Erica did an awesome job of talking about how to appreciate God's grace and practice not taking God's grace for granted. Maybe one of the best ways that we learn to appreciate God's grace, which is really kind of the theme of what Erica shared, is to see your faith not as practices that you do and rules that you follow, but a relationship that you engage Here's the essential, what do we mean by having a relationship with Jesus? Jesus becomes a person, not just an invisible God force spirit out there somewhere, but he becomes a person that we obey, a person that we follow, a person who we listen to, and a person whom we love. Think about somebody in your life you really appreciate. How do you show appreciation to them? And you just put Jesus right next to them. And just like you appreciate them, you show some appreciation to Jesus. And you pour out your appreciation to Jesus and say, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. We come to church and we worship, we sing, we celebrate, we appreciate Jesus. Maybe just sit. And you put yourself in the story right next to Jesus' mother who's watching her son suffer and die as he's hanging on a cross. And you listen to her cries and her screams. You look at Jesus as he's writing out the check for you and you see a rusty nail hammered into his wrist, each of them, and his ankles, and the shame and the embarrassment as he's mocked, people are yelling at him. A man who did nothing wrong has no sins of his own to die for, and he's up there writing the check for you. And he's suffering a cruel, painful, brutal death for you. You put yourself in that place you'll begin to appreciate God's grace. How about the greatest majority of us in the crowd? The winners of the survey. 49 folks who said, my greatest struggle with grace is to show it to others. here's Here's a way to think through that. Now, essentially what you're saying, right, is I'm struggling with tension with other people in my life of like law, justice, responsibility, mercy, grace, forgiveness. And that's really hard, right? And if I offer mercy and grace, there's a potential that I'll be hurt again, taken advantage of again. It it just, it's it's really hard. It's really, really messy. How about, so how about, here's a way to think of it, okay? What kind of a person do you want to be? 
given two options, okay? And let's just kind of play, play the, 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 the mental thought game here of like, if I go down this road of really being extreme in one way or the other, which road do I want to walk? What kind of person do I want to be? Let's say I want to be a law, justice, responsibility, accountability type of a person. Here's what you got to do if you want to walk all the way down that road. You got to keep track and you have to take an account to, of, of, and, and keep a score with every person in your life and all the things that they have done to you so that you can hold them accountable. Do you really want to be the person who keeps score of every relational wrong in your life? Because you've met some of those people. Maybe you were raised by one and you were never good enough. Do you really want to be that kind of a person who keeps score? Or you can be a person who every single time defaults to grace and forgiveness. You're like, yeah, I could be taken advantage of, but at the same time, I, I'm an adult. I can defend myself. And I'm not going to actually be like crazy, stupid, foolish with it. Like if I were to just live this, go down this road, that's just, that's a better life. Is the person who defaults to grace, mercy, and forgiveness versus this road. And all of a sudden, you're like, what kind of a person do I want to be? My guess is you're like, I want to be this kind of a person living this kind of a life. And you begin to realize that you are able and it is better to show it. By the way, if you need a Bible verse for this one, remember the haunting verse straight from the mouth of Jesus who right after the Lord's Prayer, you know that part of the Lord's Prayer that says, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us? And what did Jesus say right after that? For if you forgive the sins of those who sin against you, you will be forgiven. But if you don't forgive those who sin against you, you won't be forgiven. <laughs> you talk about like tension messing with my head. That one messes with my head. But I, but I got the basic idea. Jesus says, you have been shown grace, so show it to the people around you. That is a far better default. And you're like, okay, I can start to push through that one. And the last one, I struggle to acknowledge that I need God's grace. Looking at the story and the teaching of a guy who was faultless and said that he was faultless and how well he obeyed God, he's the one who said, Ephesians chapter 2, I, we were all dead in our sins. And dead people don't self-resurrect. All of us were dead in our sins. And if you want to be alive, it is only by the power and the grace of God. And I know that you could give a long list of reasons to justify believing that you're a good person. It's really hard to hear things like, we deserved wrath. Because it doesn't mean that everything you've always done has been wrong, terrible, and, na and you're just a nasty person. No, no. But here's the reality, okay? You can reason through this one. Grace or what? I... As if I have a choice. Here's the reality. When you think of your own goodness, the reality is you don't measure up to your own standard of goodness. You're not yet where you want to be and the kind of person you want to be, which is why you're pushing forward to be better, right? And the gap between your own standard for goodness and your, and your performance, that's grace right there. That's your need for grace. And by the way, this is only your standard for goodness. When we calculate God's standard for goodness, the gap is all that more unreachable. You need God's grace. You are desperate for God's grace. And all you do is you imagine that gap and you say, okay, God, I acknowledge my need for your grace. And the last part, worship team, why don't you guys come on back? The last part is, 
when you imagine the scenario Jesus tells us of that time in the future when there will be the judge of the earth will judge us and Jesus himself will be the judge. And he says to us, why should I let you into my heaven to spend eternity with me? What will you say? At that point, do you really want to get out your list of all the good things you've, did, you've done, knowing that you didn't even match up to your own standard of goodness and hope that you were good enough? Or would you rather say, Jesus, you shouldn't let me into your heaven. I don't deserve it. I walked away. I ran away from you. I was dead in my sins, but I'm alive only by your grace. And so in faith, I cast myself at your feet, and I'm 100% relying only on your grace. And according to the Bible, that's the right answer. I absolutely need God's grace. You absolutely need God's grace. And one of the ways that I'm praying for you is that even if it takes an appearance by Jesus himself, that you'll experience it. To bring you to your knees. And say, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I receive your grace. You've been giving me grace, Jesus. You've given me the ability to have faith, and so I'll trust you. I receive you. Jesus, I'll take the check. I'll fill in the amount and I'll cash in that check. The price that you paid for me, thank you for your grace. Grace is a struggle, but it's worth the struggle. Come on, stand with me. Let this last song be your prayer, your cry, the cry of your heart to God. It is by grace that he'll bring his peace. It is by grace that he's going to turn things around in your life. It is by grace that God has a future for you better than you could ever could have imagined. Come on, let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. You can do it from your seat. You can do it at the prayer altars. Let's make the most of these last couple of minutes together today. But let's cast ourselves on the grace of Jesus. Come on, here we go.